Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, May the 18th, 2013. Our topic today is Genius Hour, and we have a great uh, Genius Hour team with Denise Krebs, Joy Kerr, Hugh McDonald, and Gilly Vivi. And I know you're all going to be excited about finding out how we are all geniuses in our own right. As a reminder, Peggy has already dropped into the chat uh, our Live Binder link. Anyone new to the show or new to the recording, the Live Binder link will give you access to all the resources shared during the session. We also have a website, live.classroom20.com. With the archives and resources page, you're going to find pretty much the same information with some added uh, bonuses. Uh, we'll have the full Blackboard Collaborate recording. We'll have a record of the chat log. So if it goes by too quickly, don't worry. You'll catch it up there. You can find an MP3 file and an embedded video file along with all the links for today's session. So it's also a great resource to uh, share with your going back yourself or share with your colleagues. This is the part in the show, and everyone knows where that laser pointer is, just at the left-hand side of your screen, the second uh, option down. You want to click on that and show us where you are located in the world. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario in Canada, and this weekend happens to be our uh, long weekend. We're celebrating Queen Victoria's birthday, which is kind of an in interesting concept uh, many, many years later. If you can't make that laser pointer work, just, just pop in where you are in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So we have three poll questions for you today. And remember, the voting option is just below your name on the right, that little check mark. So if you click on the check mark, please, and select your option, are you familiar with Genius Hour? So it's a green check, yes, and a red X, no. Still waiting for a few people to vote there. So it's just under your name on the right-hand side. Click on that uh, check mark so that it will activate the drop-down menu. Great. I want to move forward and uh, publish results so far for the people who were able to uh, master the voting options. I just want to let you know here's the results. Uh, more than 50% of the sessions today are familiar with Genius Hour. So let's just clear the votes and go to our next poll question, which is, have you started a Genius Hour or 20% time program in your classroom or school? So again, that's the icon under your name. Eileen, I think you still have voting option right at the bottom of your screen. There should be a check mark there as well. And again, if you can't make the voting option work, just type it in the chat, yes or no, for us. Okay, let's take a look at the results. And that's a flip. About 50% have not. To, uh, actually start a genius hour or 20% time program in your classroom. Okay, great. Let's go to the third poll question. Are you or your students participating in Quest to Matter? Which is a, this is our show today is following up on last week's session with Angela Mayers about Quest to Matter. So we're asking again, how many people have you, you or your students participating in Quest to Matter? Okay, let's take a look at the results here. I think we're still a high on the no side this time again. 50% of the people in the session have, uh, have or are not uh, participating at this time. So thanks everyone for voting. Uh, it is again my opportunity to uh, share with you that uh, our topic today is Genius Hour. Our special guests today are Denise Krebs, Joy Kerr, Hugh McDonald, and Galit Zivi. So thank you very much everyone for being with us today and to our guest presenters. I believe uh, 
Denise is going to start out with a bit of an introduction as well as answering the newbie question, what does it mean to be a genius? So welcome Denise and the microphone is yours. Okay. Thank you, Nora. Yes, I'm um, Denise Krebs and hello to everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. I teach 7th and 8th grade at Spalding Catholic School in Northwest Iowa in the United States. <coughs> And I think before I answer the newbie question, I'm going to let each of the other presenters just introduce themselves quickly. That's all right. So, Galit, you want to go? Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's well, it's morning here on the West Coast, anyway. Good morning. My name is Galit, and I teach grade six and seven in Surrey, British Columbia. Good. Good morning, my name is Hugh McDonald, and I also teach 6-7 in Surrey, British Columbia. I teach with Galit, and we just absolutely love Genius Hour. Good morning, I am Joy Kerr. I teach in Illinois, and I teach a 7th grade ELA class for an 80 minute block each day. And I learned about the term Genius Hour from these three other people that are on this chat with us today. Okay, thanks. So now I will take a stab at this newbie question. What does it mean to be a genius? Well, I never gave that word much thought outside of people who were labeled as geniuses. And that would be people with IQs of over 140 on the Stanford Binet intelligence scale. But then something exciting happened. Angela Myers told me that I was a genius and the world demanded my contribution. And no matter what my IQ number was, I believed her. That was about three years ago. And, uh, and so things have not been the same since. Laura Coughlin uh, pointed me to the original meaning of this word genius. It came from generative power, the power to create and produce. So we can all do that, like Lorna said, just, just like we have a capacity to learn to read and write, we also have a capacity to be creative and productive. So now I truly believe that everyone is a genius in that sense of the word, and it's our responsibility personally to develop creativity and to contribute. And it's our responsibility to help children do the same. So now I'm going to give the mic to Galit, who will start with the important question of why do this. Before I actually get to the why, I'm just going to touch really quickly on what is Genius Hour, just because our poll results there show that there were a few people that aren't um, familiar. So Genius Hour is a time where we give our students, um, in my classroom we do an hour, but it, the time is different in different classrooms. It is a time that we give our students to learn about whatever they want. So they're able to come up with their own inquiry questions based on their passions and their wonders and their interests. And they're just given the freedom to actually explore anything they want. So I've popped up a definition there from my blog. And there's a definition here from Denise. But uh, basically, it is giving children the time so that they can learn and create about whatever it is they choose. Um, so now I'll get to the why part of this. And um, some of the people who really inspired us in, in the why do this was um, Daniel Pink and Angela Myers and Sir Ken Robinson and another um, wonderful mind here, Richard St. John. And um, he has a great TED Talk on the power of passion. And he talks about how successful people love what they do, they're passionate about what they do. And, you know, it, we don't often give our students time to figure out what it is exactly that they are passionate about. And I know when I started Genius Hour um, in 2011, I think, and asked the kids, well, what are you passionate about? I was surprised to find out that a lot of them didn't really know. There was a lot of um, well, I'm not sure, I think I like this, and well, I like hockey, and, 
and things like that, but it was really hard to get them to, you know, really articulate passions, which I think is another reason why we should be doing this, just giving them that time to actually figure out now what it is that they love. And I think we know then that that will take them farther in life and that people who do what they're passionate about, you know, you hear time and time again, those people always feel like they never had to work a day in their life, right? They're just so into what they're doing. So he's a wonderful um, mind and a great video to check out later. The link will be on the live binder. Um, another great mind, and I'm going to show you a little clip from uh, Sir Ken Robinson's video here, is um, Sir Ken Robinson, and he um, has done quite a few famous TED Talks, and the first one, I think, was, you know, do schools kill creativity? And I am just going to pop a link into our show right now so that you can all see it. Um, the little video should show up any second now on your screen. And I'm going to ask you all to press play when it shows up on your own. And we'll all just watch um, about a one and a half minute clip there. And then we can talk about what he's talking about there with um, giving students time to be creative. It's not coming up on my screen yet. Does anybody see it on theirs? Yeah, I have the spinning wheel as well. Oh. Okay, it's working now on mine. So if you see it on yours, um, it's a tube chop video because I've just chopped out a couple minutes. Um, if you go ahead and press play on yours, when you're done, if you can just click on the uh, check mark button again, the same button we used to vote earlier. Uh, when you're done, click the check mark button so that we know when everybody's finished watching the little clip here. It's just a little snippet from his TED Talk. So go ahead and press play. Okay, I'm going to bring us back to the regular slide now because it looks like a bunch of people have finished watching it. Um, if you couldn't get it to work on your computer right now, the link is in the chat and it will also be on the live binder later on and I encourage you to watch it later. In fact, I encourage everybody anyways because we only showed you a tiny little clip of a pretty brilliant video. So we'll put the full link on the live binder later on and you can have a look at it. But um, you know, what he says there I think is really important, right? He talks about, you know, it's a cute little story about his son's Christmas play, but the important message there is, you know, if kids don't know, they'll give it a go, he says, right? And, you know, I was so moved by this the first time I saw it, and I thought about that, and I think it's so true. When, when children are really little and, you know, you see it in kindergarten and everything, they are willing to try things out. They're willing to give things a go. They're, they want to be creative, and they are willing to take risks. And then the older they get, we find that they are less and less willing to take those risks with their learning. They're less and less willing to try something different, to be, you know, think outside of the box, to be creative, because they're more worried about getting it right. And, you know, I see this with a few kids every year who are petrified about, um, you know, trying something new because they don't want to fail. They don't want to get it wrong. And so one of the, you know, big major reasons for doing Genius Hour is to give kids that opportunity to be creative, to take risks in their learning, to try something new, and to figure out what it's like to go through failures and persevere. And Denise has a lovely creativity rubric, which is on the um, 
GeniusHour.wikispaces.com site. And one of the markers we use to measure creativity is their ability to persevere, their ability to go through these troubles and not give up, but keep learning. And so a Genius Hour just gives kids that time to explore that and to get good at persevering. Another person that um, has inspired Genius Hour is in fact where we got the name Genius Hour is uh, Daniel H. Pink. And if you haven't um, read his book, I really, really encourage you to check that out and also check out his TED Talk. It's really good. Um, he wrote a blog a couple years ago about Genius Hour in the workplace, which is where we all got the term from. And he talks about a bank in Washington State that gave their employees a genius hour. And it's pretty much based on the um, Google 80-20 premise, right? I mean, and some people call it 20% time in their classroom, and some people call it genius hour, and it's pretty much all um, roughly the same thing. And so Daniel's blog a couple years ago, um, he writes about this bank and how it's really, you know, motivated employees because they've got this um, time to be autonomous. And so Angela Myers uh, retweeted that blog and said, you know, we should do this in schools. And then thank goodness Denise saw that because Denise was the one then that was, wrote another blog entry, her own, about, you know, deciding to try it in her classroom. That's how we all pretty much got on board then. And that's how we all pretty much heard about it. And, you know, in his book, he talks about how if you give people the freedom to be autonomous, to pick what they want to learn about, that that's what will motivate them to do great things. So motivation comes with autonomy, purpose, and mastery. Give the kids the time to be autonomous, to choose what they want to learn about, and that will give them, you know, the purpose to learn about it, and they will master those new um, concepts. So we are using his philosophy there. We're using his um, research on motivation, and we have found that it, it really does it really does work. When we take away grades, when we take away the, you know, this is what you have to do to do it right and please the teacher and get the marks and, and everything, when we take that all away and just let kids learn for the sake of learning, their motivation goes through the roof. And, you know, I see Peggy's comment here saying it's scary for teachers to give up control and for students to be more autonomous. And it's so true. And a good friend of mine, um, at, she was at my school a few years ago, a good friend of mine just started doing Genius Hour herself. And she was a self, you know, admitted control freak in the classroom. And she was so nervous to actually, you know, step aside and let the kids take control. Um, but I just heard her give a, a talk the other day and it was so moving, it made me tear up. You know, she has found so much more um, purpose in her teaching now that she's learned how to step aside and now that she has given up that control to her students and the students have just, you know, she teaches grade four, so these are much younger kids, but um, they have just ran with Genius Hour and have started to do really amazing things in her classroom. And so, you know, it's hard sometimes, I know, to, to be able to step aside and not have a lesson plan for an hour. But I think if we give our kids that opportunity, they will really, really impress us. Um, so yeah, we're moving away from that teacher dictatorship and the irrelevant assignments and the covering of the curriculum. And we're giving kids the, um, the time to just choose what they want to learn. So I talked with Angela Myers before. And um, thank goodness she was the one that retweeted um, Dan Pink's blog there, because I think that's really what um, got us all thinking about this, right? And um, Angela Myers has written a book called um, The Passion Bait, Passion Driven Classroom. Um, she's written that with Amy Sandals. And if you haven't checked out that book, that's a really great one to read this summer as well. She um, talks about, you know, letting kids um, find their passion and doing that in the classroom. And that was really um, a great inspiration for Genius Hour. And that's exactly why we do it, right? We want our kids to just have that opportunity to be passionate about something and to explore their passions, to take time to really, really um, explore those passions. 
So another why, why Genius Hour, another reason, uh, 21st century learning skills, right? So uh, some people have come to, you know, me and Denise and Hugh and Joy before, and they've said, well, you know, the Genius Hour sounds great and all, but you're not covering the curriculum, and, and how do you, you know, get away with that? How are you able to convince others that that's worthwhile? And so um, one of the things we come back to then is the, um, the four C's, right? The 21st century learning skills, and I think there might be even more than four C's. But um, it is still worthwhile. It is still worthwhile time, of course, besides having kids find their passion. They are being able to be creative. They are working on their collaboration skills, their communication skills, when they present back their learning, their critical thinking skills as they go through all of the um, all of the steps of their project, right, and thinking through their problems. So um, even if you're not, you know, covering the curriculum, you're still covering uh, really important learning skills there. So that's another big why for why do Genius Hour, right, another big reason. Um, I'm going to show you another little clip, and it's um, from the video, Creativity Takes Time, and it's really just a short video, but I still just took an excerpt of it, um, but I encourage you to watch the whole thing later on. So I'm going to try this again where we um, go to a video clip. Okay, that worked a lot quicker this time. Awesome. Okay, so why doesn't everybody press play on their own computers there, and then let's do the check mark thing again when you're done, and then we'll talk about this video. Okay, so go ahead and press play. Okay, so it looks like just about everybody has finished it. Um, it is an amazing video, so um, check out the whole thing later on after the um, webinar. And it's really short. It's just a few, maybe a one minute longer than what I showed you. But I take the time to look at that. It is the video that Hugh and I introduced Genius Hour with. We show this to the children, and then we say, you know, okay, so boys and girls, we are going to give you that time, right? Um, and we understand that creativity takes time, and we are going to give you the time. And just like these kids came up with amazing pictures after they were given time, we know you're going to come up with amazing projects after we give you some time. Um, so that's how we introduce it. And the, you know, the logic in this video is, I mean, it's, yeah, it's logical. The argument is logical, right? If you give the kids the time to be creative, they will amaze you with what they're able to come up with. And that's why we feel like it's so important to give the kids a genius hour or 20% time or passion project time, whatever you want to call it, but give them that time to just really be creative and show you what they are capable of. I think we've all found that when we do that, we are really truly amazed with what the kids show us. So um, another thing we do to introduce it is um, we do a passion and wonder wall. So there's a picture of um, one of the boards in um, Hughes in my classroom. Hugh and I team teach, so we are always together. And you know our students make this uh, based on their passions and wonders. And this is um, what they can add to um, during the year, and then what they can look to for when they need inspiration for their Genius Hour project. So um, you know. There's kids that wonder about cooking and baking or what made space, and, and they can put all those things up there, and then that's what they um, use as kind of a starting point for their Genius Hour project. So I'm going to end on this one here, and then I'm going to pass the mic over to Hugh, who's going to talk a little bit more about Genius Hour. But this is a slide that Denise made a little while ago, and um, you know, I just I loved it so much and wanted to throw it in here, and I think we've all found that, you know, right here, our kids will be geniuses. We will look for it. All right, so I'm going to pass it to you, Hugh. Okay, I'm here. Uh, just to chat about examples, uh, just skip over a slide. Okay, there it is. Uh, this is Robin Thiessen, who's also in the room, who started the Global Genius Hour project. Uh, it allows classes and teachers to connect the learning, the Genius Hour learning that is happening in their rooms with other classes around the world. So highly encourage you to check it out, the Global Genius Hour project dot wikispaces dot com. 
Um, thank you to Robin for setting that up. Um, ready to go. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to share with you some different examples. Um, this is a boy in our class who wanted to create a stop motion, and this was before we had any iPads in our room. He was taking individual shots of his Lego, and he created a he created a little film. So this is a boy who struggles with learning generally, and he was just engaged probably for about four class sessions in a row, which is just like he was so focused nobody could nobody could stop what he was doing. Uh, other another one we creating cooking shows. We have students who are now very comfortable, you know, with their own devices at home and just creating cooking shows and so they add te they learn how to add text, they learn how to edit clips and learn how to be engaging and they just created their own content. And this this one is actually on YouTube on my channel as well. These are two grade six students who created this. Uh, this is more of their this is more of their cake. You can see I just took little clips, screenshot clips from their cake. So this is like a little pull apart cake and they came in and presented and these are two pretty quiet girls and they came in and presented and talked and answered all the questions from all the kids and felt pretty confident about it and then afterwards we got to all partake in the cake that they created. Um, the kids love doing science experiments so Genius Hour is inquiry based and uh, the, these are some kids who are you know just just trying something new and trying something they did they've never done before and they're wondering what it would be like and they went outside and they did a science experiment and then they then they showed us about it and taught us about it. Uh, kids who love to play music we have a we have a piano in our school that sometimes finds its way in different parts of our school sometimes in the hallway sometimes up by the gym and there, we have a couple students who periodically, you know, just their, their own recess breaks, their own lunch breaks, sometimes, a lot of times before school, just playing, just playing piano and then showcasing that their, their skills and their learning with, with others. And one of the girls in this video or in this clip here actually came from Turkey and used to play piano a lot. And then when she came to, she, when she came to Canada, they, the family didn't have a piano. And she was searching for that, you know, the ability to have an outlet for herself. And she was able to find a piano, and then she was able to draw in other kids, and she was helping other kids learn the piano as well. Um, there's the camcorder, kids making movies, which is a popular aspect in our classroom. We are, Galit and I are always big proponents of them telling their story, their learning story, and so a lot of them choose to do that by little videos and plus it helps those kids who struggle with presentation skills just to go do a lot of the background work on their own and then come in and show people what they've done and then afterwards they're standing up there confidently able to talk about what they've done because they've 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 been a big part of their you know the development of their learning. Um, iPad, we were fortunate to get some iPads and so the kids were busy. We a lot of times, Galit and I a lot of times just We'll find out apps from the kids that will they think will help them, and we will download them onto our computers. So I know one of the ones that's popular is iMotion HD, and so some of the kids like to make stop motion. And I have created a let's see here if I can get it up here. I'm going to try it's a little 15 second. No, where did my little clip go? Let me just try to pull it up here. Oh, I too chopped it, so I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's going to be a little 15-second little clip, and this is a this is from a boy who who struggles with severe anxiety and ADHD, and he was able to stand in front of the class and confidently tell people about his learning and how he went about it. And so this is the little clip that he created. And hopefully people can see it. So you can just press, same, same as before, you can just press play on your own individual screens and then you can 
click yes or no up at the top here. So it's, it's really quick. It's, it's like 15 seconds long. He used he used uh, iMotion HD, I believe, is what the what the app is called. There's a lot of different ones out there. Actually, there's the National Film Board. Pick Stop was a, was another one that some of my kids have been playing with. I, I chose this one because th this is a kid that he he struggles with his learning and getting motivated for his learning, but he pretty much planned the entire thing at school and did the entire project at home actually. And on his own time, and his parents were telling us he spent hours and hours and hours just manipulating his his own personal Lego just to be able to 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 complete it. So I'm looking here. I'm thinking most people are getting through here. So just gonna push over one more slide here. Okay, here we go. So we get you know kids learning about different elements of trying to grow different things in science and physics, right? Trying new things, manipulating, building, and we also believe Sir Ken Robinson's a big believer of kids exploring their passions and not being sort of try to fit everything into one box. And so if kids are wanting to try something new. And teach it to somebody. Why not? And so this is an example of a boy who is who is trying to perfect his jump shot, and then doing an instructional video on how to perfect his jump shot, and so other kids can learn from him. So I think that is the end of my slides for right now, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Joy. All right. Um, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> um, I'm fairly sure that each class has someone in it that's making a film of some sort. It's great when they get friends not even in the class to help them with plot development, makeup, acting, and filming. The things they say they learn from making films is amazing. Not only do they worry about the characters and storyline, but Maddie, she's the one with her thumbs up in there, she wrote in her blog the other day that she had to learn how to make edible fake blood, and she was trying to learn how to cry on cue. And who would have thought, and I keep thinking that, what are the standards here? It's the plot development, the characterization. She's got it going on here. We have a lot of students creating determination type posters, creating graffiti type designs on reusable materials, photography products, learning how to play the ukulele. They will be presenting in many different ways as well. They'll either be playing a song, holding a gallery walk, showing slides of their art, and it's their decision. And we are there to help guide them and facilitate them. This is a short video. Um, Galit, do you know how to play this for me? I don't know how to play this. This is one of Kevin Brookhauser's students from the West Coast explaining how her music project is helping others. Can we play this somehow? Um, yes, you just go to the button with the globe there. I don't have your link, though. If you put your link in the chat, I can play it for you. OK. I'll have to find that one later. I don't have that one. Um, I'll put that in the in the chat button later, but she, it's only two minutes, but what she's doing is she is making a concert. She's singing and playing the piano to support the library, and I think it was last weekend, actually, and what the admission was was a book. So people had to come and bring a book, and it went right to their, their library that they needed books in. And this is one way that students are using their passions to make the world better. Um, it is about things that matter to them. They raise money for a cause. I know Denise's students are going to raise money for Down syndrome, and that might not even be their genius hour project, but that's where they're going because of what they've done this year. I have a student who wants to know the importance of the US Coast Guard because she knows some people in it. Um, another one is trying random acts of kindness. One wants people to feel fortunate for all they have after he gives his presentation. And here, they're making scarves for a benefit from a, for a mom in, is it Denise's school? It, with cancer. So they're making scarves to benefit for that. Um, one other way, you know, they, everybody says that 
this time set aside is a time for students to take charge of their learning. And this is so very true. We have students excited to work on their Genius Hour projects at lunch, before and after school. We have students excited to come to class and learn what they want to learn. However, another thing that is happening, and I believe it's happening to each of us that's implementing it, is that this time is transforming our teaching in other aspects of the quote unquote regular classroom routine as well. One way that it's working for me is that um, I have my students owning their own learning throughout the day. So it's affected my classroom in the choices that we make. I now have various options for sitting, from homemade milk crates with pillows, thank you to my husband, to students bringing in their own gaming chairs. Um, we've set up a sign-up sheet for the month so there are no disputes, and students can sit in comfort rather than sitting on those plastic chairs all day. Another choice that my classes have is where to sit. I have only one class in assigned seating this month because they needed the structure in order to learn. And they are aware of that. They know that they will get it back when I can trust them. Um, but if students can sit where they like and still learn, why take that away from them? I hope that students see that I value their comfort and ability to make decisions. And this, I believe, has come from Genius Hour. Still thinking of student comfort, why not go with the flow? This picture represents the day I realized what one of my students' passions was. She loves quotes, and we got that from um, Mick Teach out here that's here with us today. We did our blog post, our paper blog post, and she said she loves positive quotes. So I was so excited because I was going to use this back chalkboard to put a positive quote of the day up every day. She gladly accepted that responsibility. And the rest of my students often give her quotes to add to the board. But this picture was taken on a day when she was absent. Notice the four seventh graders that stepped up to fill her place. It's not my classroom anymore. It's the student's classroom. And they really should have a say in what goes into it. I hope that students realize that they're needed to make the classroom a more positive place in their lives, that I want them to be invested in their own learning. This, too, has come from me implementing Genius Hour. Um, <laughs> So why did I for years spend hours on decorating my room when it's not really my room? Genius Hour has made me want to trust my students more. They're messy. Learning is messy. Denise keeps saying that. Check out this bulletin board, messy proof of learning. Talk about um, those people that have control issues. They would have a big problem with this bulletin board. You'll see some of their projects stapled to it for all to see. We think there's no rhyme or reason, but each student con contribution here was put there by a student where he or she wanted it located, not me. Even the box on the lower right, the little brown thing, that's Trevor's treasure chest. It was brought in by Trevor so we could make voting for certain choices more fun. They love putting their votes in the treasure chest, so why not? Around the time I started giving students choice for Genius Hour, I also gave up my desk. I'm going to bring up Laura Coughlin's name again from Missouri. She inspired me to do this. It's the student's room, not mine, and they have a right to the supplies. Again, this is a trust issue, just like with Genius Hour. If you trust your students to learn what they want to learn, then trust them with paper clips, a hole punch, colored pencils, whiteboards, etc. <laughs> yes, there are pencils that are taken. Yes, I replace them. Now, this might not mean anything to you, and in fact, it took me a day or two to understand, but it was needed. My middle class decided that they needed a behavior plan, and they came up with this. It's a little convoluted, so I'm not going to tell you what it means, but they saw a need, and they acted on it. This, too, is a product of a session of Genius Hour. We took a whole session on Genius Hour because they knew we were having issues with behavior. So it's a fixture in our room now, and it works. Other ways that to provide choice in your day, show students that they matter and that their choices are important. They see this and they, they start changing your class. They start to offer you alternate activities or ideas, seating arrangement, creative assessments, various ways to turn in homework. They're also more willing to take risks and possibly fail. The kids are more open and expressive. They know we're listening to their ideas. It can get kind of crazy when they come up with ideas for many things, but it also makes the classroom more of a community. It really helps students to be engaged and wanting to learn. I truly believe some sort of genius hour and many opportunities for student choice help students develop that love for lifelong learning. Um, that's my shtick. It's how it's impacted the rest of my class. And I'm pretty sure that it's happening in Denise and Hughes and Gleets and everybody else who is starting to implement this in their classes as well. Denise is now going to tell you about how this love of learning will reach even farther outside of the classroom. <clears throat> okay. 
I'm going to scroll through these slides a little quickly. If anybody wants to read them, they'll be there later. But um, yes, I have. Um, I just want to say an amen to what Joey said and everyone. What Julie Sauer has done for my class is so much bigger than the 20% time that we that we do it, I guess. It's more of a philosophy. And so I'm no longer the one who dispenses knowledge. Students are empowered and encouraged to learn. They know that they matter. And like this image suggests, I've learned an important lesson. I don't get impatient with them when they don't listen to me. Instead, I delight when they're fully participating, when they're discussing and sharing, oftentimes too loud in some people's opinion. But I do much more listening nowadays. The, uh, yeah, it, it took me years to figure this out, that it's the learner's involvement that is going to ensure learning, not, not my activity. We, we become so busy telling students what to do that we sometimes don't take the time to just let them be. In genius hour, you get to step aside and let them be active, be daring, curious, creative, and so much more. Now, sometimes our learners will choose to do amazing things during genius hour, like Karen McMillan's kids and Aaron Olson's high school students who who are doing amazing things that change the world, building libraries half a world away, creating and raising funds and awareness. But sometimes they'll want to do things like help people appreciate spiders, like Angela talked about last week. She mentioned a first grader that wanted to um, have people appreciate spiders. So I believe so strongly in Genius Hour that that it's about the choice, that we need to honor the choices that they make. And because that's what choice means, right? They get to choose what to learn, produce, and create. And sometimes their choices are unremarkable. However, sometimes they, they can be remarkable. And I wanted, to, I wanted to try to tie Genius Hour Learning into Angela's quest to matter. Um, I had been trying to inspire that um, this, all this year that, that they would scale up some of their choices in Genius Hour and not always just want to bake or make stop motion animation or do things. But, I, but again, I wanted to honor their, their choices. So, so one way I inadvertently got them doing something more like this is using this chart. Sylvia Rosenthal Talisano, uh, the languages, made this chart kind of a scaled up KWL chart. And Paul Spolers, who does Genius Hour, um, uses it to, to introduce Genius Hour for his kids. They have to fill this out before they start their project. So I was using that for an independent science research project. And when they got to the column A, the what action will I take, all of a sudden they began to gain <laughs> They came up with these ideas, like they wanted to raise awareness for Down syndrome, have a car wash, lemonade stand. They were doing amazing brainstorming and exciting actions, just, just because I gave them that question, I guess, and, and maybe a little bit that I was trying to inspire them to do that over the year. But um, when I wanted to tie Genius Hour, because as you see from our slides, in our, in our talk, Genius Hour is not always about changing the world. Um, we haven't always asked this question, what breaks your heart about the world, and then asked them to act on that. We've, we've given them choices. But once in a while, a student has a great idea, and then it can spread to a whole group. So if one student has a passion that breaks his heart, then perhaps the whole class will want to join in and help make amazing things happen. That's what I think is happening in our class now, because one student's aunt with Down syndrome died recently, so then he wanted to study Down syndrome in science. And his group chose that research topic, but now the whole class is making plans to do something about it. 
and we'll be adding their as yet unfinished product to um, Angela's quest to matter. And so I'd like to ask, I'd like to suggest and hope, hopefully encourage you all to, to consider that too, of having your geniuses join the quest to matter. It doesn't have to come from their genius hour projects, as you can see, because I don't know that cupcakes would be one. We've made a lot of cupcakes this year. And I wouldn't um, think that that's a quest to matter project, but there are others. And they don't all have to be, yeah, they might be born in genius hour, but then nurtured in a large group, maybe with teacher direction. Because another project my students are submitting to, to the Quest to Matter is the work that we did for our American Cancer Society fundraising. It wasn't during genius hour at all, but it was an amazing experience. And it was led by geniuses who believed that they were geniuses and that the world needed their contribution. So I think that everyone in this room who's done Genius Hour can attest that those students who we let take ownership, complete ownership of their learning, for at least part of the time, will be transformed. The classroom will be transformed. They will personally be transformed. And the teachers. I know it, and, and we all know it who've done it, and I hope you'll, you'll say, um, say something in the, in the chat and in the questions, like, tell us your story, because we want to hear. We want to see blog posts that you've done, because we know that there's tons of people out doing Genius Hour. So one, one challenge I would like to say is don't say, oh, this is a good idea. I'm going to say, I'm going to do this next year. Do it today. No, not today, because there's no school today. Do it Monday, because uh, then you'll see, you'll make some mistakes, and and then you'll know next year, you'll know what to do different or, or what to carry on with, okay? So we want to um, hear all about it. Thanks. That's all. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Janice. That's a lot. I know people in the session have been madly typing away their ideas and enjoying the session. This is the opportunity for uh, us to take some questions. And I asked Lori if she has managed to get anything in the chat that she can bring to the presenters. And if not, as Peggy said, type it in the chat now. Yes, I did manage to, to snag a couple. Um, I asked my students to write a goal to guide them. They have to learn, in quotes, practice, in quotes, or create, in quotes. What do you think as far as, I guess, guiding beginning genius hour thinking? Yes, I, I did comment to that in the chat, so I'll, I'd like to hear somebody else's opinion about that. I think, I think those are great things that help people to do it. it um, I like the practice one because mastery is important. Uh, we don't give kids enough time to do things in school, so I think we need to always let them keep working, keep working and mastering something. But anybody else have a comment about that? Yeah, I'll share. Um, I did hear a, a second grade class in my area, Danielle Port. She's trying it first at the beginning of the year with the whole class as saying, what does the whole class want to learn about? And she asked them about countries. And so their practice was together on one country. And so she asked, what do you want to learn about this one country now that we voted? And each student wanted to learn something else. So that was that was the practice session with everybody learning about the same thing, but they were learning about different things within that context, and she was giving them that time and the practice and the role modeling. But um, also, it's different with each student. Like Some students really need the structure and really need to know, what do I do next? And you need to sit with them and try and take it step by step with them and see what they need to do. And then some students just fly, and they just go off on their own, and you don't need to talk to them hardly at all. Um, at least in seventh grade, I find this. And so it it's, makes it very much more independent and individualized. And you're sitting down with students more often than you would normally in a regular class without it. Does that help? Yes, thanks. Another question I have captured is, what's the best way to sell the need for Genius Hour to your admin when they are so focused on testing results?
Hello, did you want to take that one? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, the best the best way I can 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 tell them that is is to start it, do it, and then bring your admin down and show them the learning that's happening in the room. Uh, you, when you see the learning in the room, it it's it's ma it's ma it's pure magic. You cannot you cannot deny that there's learning going on and that there's engaged and motivated learners there. Uh, I don't know the last time that somebody said I'm motivated to do a test or I'm motivated to I can't wait for this test. It's I want to learn something I want to learn about and give me time and teach me how I can do that. Here's a, a question that just came in chat. How, how to achieve this in high school classrooms or convince those who are tied to covering curriculum for tests, especially high school tests? There are a lot of high school teachers doing it, at least in English language arts. Um, mm -hmm. The live binder on the high school page has a few there. And now there are some science ones as well. And if you take there was a science teacher, Allison Fueling, she's in Wisconsin, and she's trying it in her biology class. And there are a lot of things she's not going to get to this year because mm -hmm. she's trying this 20% time. But the things that the students are coming up with to research fit into her curriculum in no problem. They, they are asked to research something about biology, and they're going in all different directions. And she has realized that she has covered lots of little or smaller ideas with her students presenting, and it's not her presenting anymore. And Kevin Brookhauser doing it in ELA in Idaho, I believe he's there. He is doing the speaking and listening aspect of it, where they have to give a stellar five-minute presentation at the end of theirs, and it has to be quality work. And that goes right into his standards with no, no issue. If you take out the standards for 20th, 21st century learners, as well as Galit was talking about earlier today, they fit right into that as well. So that's what I've seen. I haven't been asked about it in my seventh grade class yet mm -hmm. because my administration is totally on board. But with the high schools, um, check out 20 time in education and see what you can find there. There are lots of resources there. And the last one that I have, how can a teacher that teaches six periods incorporate Genius Hour? I think that was also answered in chat, but it's one I captured. Can I just, I'll just say one thing that um, some people do do Genius Hour when they have like a science teacher, for instance, Chris Kessler in Texas is teaching, and he has all science classes. So one day a week, they do Genius Hour. It's, it's a little bit more difficult when you don't have as, um, as much time. But then they, yeah, they just, it, it's too, I, I've suggested that people like that work with other teachers. If they can find someone on board, then the reflecting part can happen in the English room, say, the genius hour in science. And then maybe they can do some of the writing and reflecting and producing in their English class. But it isn't. Um, great when you only have one period and you're not working with other teachers. Here in Surrey, British Columbia, we've actually got one high school teacher, uh, Valerie Lease. Um, she has proposed doing an entire Genius Hour course at her school and it got approved and she's actually going to be starting a locally developed Genius Hour program at her school next year where the kids will take Genius Hour as a class. So um, I think as time goes on, it will become more and more um, easy to do for people. And the more we have people starting to do it in their classrooms at the high school level, it will become, I think, easier for others to jump on board because there will be so many more examples. So Valerie Lease is one to watch on Twitter to see how that goes for her next year. And the same thing, Galit, with Don Wetrick. He's doing that innovations class. I don't remember what state he's from, but he's doing his own class on 20% in right. Virginia's hour, but it's a whole 100% of the time. Yeah. Right. So fantastic. I just must if say one more thing. Oh. 
I was going to say, do you have a question? Put your little hand up button there. Thanks. I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, we, we Galit and I teach in the biggest school district in the province of British Columbia. And it is sweet, Genius Hour is sweeping across our, our district. And it's not just limited to intermediate classrooms. It's primary classrooms. It's high school classrooms. Courses are being developed. Uh, people are making the time because they realize how powerful it can be. And I, I just think if it's a good idea, it's a good idea, and we need to make sure we find a way to get it done. Um, I, I know there, there's learning outcomes and core standards, and all of that can be tied into Genius Hour. It's just not necessarily graded because of the purpose, why we do things. So go ahead, Stephanie. You have the mic. If you want to click on the talk button, and then we'll be able to hear your question. I teach first grade, and I'm very excited about this. I read the Passion Driven Classroom uh, last summer, and Angela is working with our school district this year. And just listening to the live chat today has got me really excited. I've got five days left, though. Um, but I am wondering, with primary classrooms, any suggestions or tips in helping students move away from seeing that time as free time? And I, I believe in the value of play but taking it deeper or further so they see it um, uh, just more than free time. Any suggestions? I think you made an excellent point with the, you know, how important it is though to learn through play also. And, you know, we like to model, <laughs> Hugh and I like to model our classroom with just grade six and seven on grade one and kindergarten and grade one, right? We try to incorporate more of your play time into our class. But um, in terms of like how to make it successful, uh, what I've done with our little buddy class, um, my little buddy class is kindergartners. We've done Genius Hour with them, so we bring in some older kids and we help them with their passion projects. And we've done that. Um, you know, a few times every year. So that's just an idea, maybe, is to get your um, big buddy class involved and have them help your little kids with their project. Any other ideas? I had I had one other I had one other idea. That one of the most powerful things that I found to get my students going with Genius Hour, and I would think it would translate to the primary was was actually doing a, a Genius Era project myself and then leading the students through my thinking and my struggles as I was doing it. And it just sort of, it gave them the power to think, okay, it's okay to not understand something right away. This is what I do after. And it sort of, I would think it would, could work probably on a, a little, on the same scale for primary students. Great. Thanks very much, Hugh and everyone. I'm just looking at we're at the top of the hour. I would like to close out the show officially. And if there's still questions uh, after I've uh, given the closing, that uh, you can come back if our panel's still able to stay for a minute if there's any more questions. So I think, Hugh, before I go, I need you to talk about this, though, the genius hour. I think you were going to do that. Oh. Yeah, I can. I can to a little bit. For, uh, for anybody that's not on Twitter, uh, highly recommended as a learning, a wonderful learning network. I've met so many great people. Many of them are in this chat right now. Uh, we chat on a hashtag called Genius Hour, and it's, it's like essentially like a folder. And we agree to meet every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And the chat was started by Galit and Denise. And they mod they moderate the chat and they search for topics each week and they put out calls for topics and and then on the first Wednesday of each month at 6 p.m. Pacific time uh, we jump in and we talk and it's wonderful and people share ideas and their struggles and think and just what do I do next and it's a tremendous opportunity to talk with people as well. Great, thanks. I think everyone appreciates how much how powerful uh, Twitter chats are.
So I think we have our contact information. Again, this will be in the live binder later if you want to directly connect with Denise, Joy, Galit, or Hugh. You have their Twitter IDs as well as their email address where they are accessible. So just before we let you all go, the uh, Future of Education series with uh, Steve Hargadon. There's four great sessions coming up uh, this Tuesday, May the 21st. Ernie, Ernie Turner and Simona Deva will be talking about engaging school communities one at a time. The 23rd on Thursday, Will Richardson with about why school. Uh, on the 30th Thursday, Franz Johansson on the click moment. And uh, Tuesday, June the 4th, Dawn Winkle on student entrepreneurship and the real flipped learning. And here's some reminders for you. Um, our upcoming show next week, we will not have one in uh, response to people being on holiday for the more Memorial Day weekend. Uh, June the 1st, we'll be looking for our own uh, Tammy Moore, who has been so uh, generously providing closed captions for us today. Tammy will be presenting on Adobe Captivate, which is completely different from Adobe Connect, a web conferencing system. This is about Adobe Captivate as a learning management system and a lot of other great things. And on June the 8th, I have the pleasure of bringing back Rod Lussier and to talk about the Unplugged.ca uh, uh, event that was held last August. And I know that 2013 session is coming up again as well. And I think you're going to appreciate uh, hearing how a group of people have actually connected and linked together and still be unplugged. And uh, Peggy's going to speak to this, the 4T virtual conference. So go ahead, Peggy. Absolutely. I will post this link in the chat. I just can't do two things at once. But um, the 4T virtual conference is fabulous every year. It's sponsored by the University of Michigan. And Liz Kolb, whom I'm sure many of you know from her Cell Phones for Learning book, is the organizer of this conference. It's all about teachers using technology, which is where the 4Ts come from. Teachers teaching teachers about technology. It started this morning. The first session was amazing. It was actually a two-hour session. And it was all about settings on iPads and how to get things organized and working for you. And then the second part was about a lot of different productivity apps for students. Everything is done in um, Illuminate. It's an older version than the one we're using, but it works great. And you can. Um, Go and view the recordings if you have to miss them. But they have multiple sessions all day long today through the 21st. You have to register to get access to the links, but it's all free. So I strongly encourage you to check it out. Thanks, Peggy. And a reminder, we do have a Featured Teacher of the Month, and we always look forward to having you nominate someone. The link is there for you to access. And again, if you can't quickly write that down, which I'm sure you can't, um, you'll go to our Live Binder under Classroom 20 Live, and you'll find links to uh, the particular session. And uh, when you close out the session, reminder, we have a, a survey we ask you to quickly jot down um, your comments and ideas for future shows, as well as if you want the uh, professional development certificate. Um, you'll find a place on the survey form to do that. And if that doesn't come up or you've missed it and can't relocate it, please go back to our live binder, because I said we have our resources there for you to get access to uh, getting a professional development uh, certificate, which uh, faithfully, Peggy sends out every session. And you can get uh, the certificate for recordings as well. So if you want to pass that on to colleagues who weren't there today and still want the certificate, they can also get it by, um, again, requesting it through the uh, survey or through the um, live binder. We do have a U iTunes U channel where you can get access to our video and audio collection. As well, just to point out to everyone, we do our archives and resources page is a blog format, so you can uh, add us to your RSS uh, reader and uh, follow along with the, the resources every week in case you were not able to be with us today. And a special thanks today to our great uh, panel who had such expertise to share: Denise Krebs, Joy Kerr, Hugh McDonald, and Galit Zvi. 
We are very appreciative of you having taken the time today to uh, provide all these resources. Of course, we always ask Steve Hargan, our founder of Classroom 20, for being our support and providing the opportunities, along as his other work with Future 20, Future of Education, and Web 20 Labs project. We thank Weebly.com for providing our website and for everyone here for sharing their ideas. Don't uh, worry to go back to the archives page to get access to the chat because there was a lot of information being shared today, and I know you want to go back and see it. So, thank you again, panel, for being with us today. It's a uh, chance to anyone else have a question or a comment they would like to share and uh, I can give you the mic access and if we're all happy then we'll move on to our exciting rest of our day. I know for some of you it's uh, a holiday. So again I'm asking is there anyone else who has another question or comment they would like to ask of the panel. So Mrs. TG, I'm going to give you mic access, so go ahead. Click on the talk button. No, I think she was leaving, so that was a, a misread. I'm just scrolling down the chat. It was uh, busy going while I wasn't here. So I'm not seeing anyone else asking questions unless there was something popped up in the chat that I didn't see. Peggy, is there anything I missed here? Because it wasn't scrolling um, while I was talking. Paula has her hand up and she has the mic. So Paula, go ahead and click on talk. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this wonderful uh, Genius Hour webinar. Um, I follow all these great presenters on Twitter and uh, have done a little bit of Genius Hour in my classroom. Uh, my question, I, I kind of have problems every Saturday getting on, so I'm not quite sure how the, the whole thing started, but is there anyone in the group that could give um, the easiest way for a newbie teacher to get their feet wet doing Genius Hour or 20% time. One, one quick little thing that would get them started. Thank you. I think you just have to, you know, jump in. Just make that commitment to actually go ahead and give it a go. And um, a couple primary teachers that I know, um, Trish Miller and Daniel Lee, they came up with an acronym, IDEAS, I-D-E-A-S, and they told their kids that they're going to have time to invent something, I for invent, or D for design something, or E for experiment something, um, and then the last A was for, I can't remember, I'll have to look that one up, and then the S at the very end, is, and then they'll have time to share it with the class. So coming up with the, you know, a simple little acronym for like something like that for your class if they're younger, and just making that commitment to just go. Anyone else? I think maybe another way to get started is to, to try it when we have those extra days. Like we have three days at the end of the year this year that are not graded at all. And if you can get kids inspired before then to get ready to create or design or do whatnot on those days, then go for it. Um, some teachers have a day or two after a unit and then a vacation is coming up and they don't want to start something new. You can prepare for it then as well. Um, Hugh or Denise, did you have another one? Yeah. I put some things in the chat too, so that's all. I think you guys gave some good ideas, and there's good links in the chat too. Yeah, I think yeah, I was going to say the same thing as Denise. There's there's some great links in the chat. Some of the videos that are even in the Genius Hour Wiki or in the Live Binder. Some great links to videos. One of the uh, one of the one of my favorite ones to show is uh, obvious to you, amazing to others. Uh, another one is the creativity takes time. Uh, there's plenty of inspirational videos out there that just that just gives kids sort of modeling models of kids or adults that are 
doing inquiry type thinking as they're going through a project. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Anyone else with a comment or question before we sign off? I know we're getting closer. I'm not seeing anyone. Oh, wait a second. Someone has raised their hand. Am I just missing that? Julie. Nope. I'm not sure. I think people are just um, trying different options here at the moment. So again, maybe I they're waving goodbye. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> or we're trying to get the emoticons of applause are going as well. I think it's a little confusing. Anyone who wants to, uh, the correct way to exit the session, I didn't get a chance to explain that, but you need to exit your browser and not just say away, because that'll just keep you with us and we'll have to remove you later on. But everyone has to say, goodbye in a few minutes so we can catch the recording. But uh, one more time, my opportunity along with Peggy to uh, thank you very much for not only a great presentation, but actually taking Saturday and all the time that went in preparing for your presentation it was uh, really appreciated. So thank you much. For, excuse me. Thank you very much, everyone. And have a great holiday weekend. The rest is here, those of us in Canada and for those in the States next weekend. So thanks very much and have a great day.